Welcome to Thursday, June 10. It's our class session, Math 264, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations at Delta College. And today we get to accomplish some really nice things near the end of chapter three. We are going to finish our classification of all first order linear systems, two dimensional first order linear systems. And then we'll do some samples of any question you like here. I'll let you toss in some questions you want to see. Now, you tonight are submitting a problem from 3, 5, and 3, 4. 3, 5, the transition cases, we'll give you some examples here. We'll pick some problem out of the book. 3, 4, the complex number arithmetic case complex eigenvalue case, which is the messiest, possibly the messiest calculation you have to do. But after that, then you've seen all the possible calculations after we talk about these transition cases and the messy complex case. And after that, on Monday, we'll be able to say, okay, how do we put all 13, 15 cases together into one beautiful box, one beautiful picture. The last time I showed you the picture, and I guess it doesn't hurt to show it again. So let me just pull this up, although I'm not ready. This picture that I'm about to show you comes from section 3.7, not ready to exactly explain this whole picture yet. So let me pull it up and then I'll share that screen and then we'll go over to our whiteboard. But from this picture, I can tell you what to expect. So let me share this browser window. So this is one of the handouts from my website. It's the one called the trace determinant plane. And so on this handout, think of this like a, maybe it's a family tree if you like for the matrix A, B, C, D. I'll go through every possible case uh, with the exception of the mystery point. Let's trace the family history of matrix A. Well, there's only three possibilities. It's got a determinant and a trace. The determinant can be negative, positive, or zero. And you see those three cases. If the determinant is negative, you absolutely have a saddle. And you have no questions asked. If the determinant is positive, you've got to sort through a bunch of cases. If the determinant is zero, you have one of the border cases that we're going to talk about today. And so you ask, why did I decide to classify this first by the determinant? Because it was the easiest way to chop the matrix into three chunks. And I'll show you that on the whiteboard in a second. You could classify all linear systems with this little family tree. I guess if I was to add the mystery point, and I'm not going to do that right now, on a piece of paper, but if I was to add the mystery point, it would be, am I allowed to draw on this window? It would be right here. I would have T equals zero. Very hard to write with your finger on a trackpad. And this is, so there's no way I'm going to spell out mystery point. I'll just say MP, mystery point. Now let's not worry about that right now because that is like the last case we're going to examine. So if you think about it, here is determinant, negative, zero, or positive. And then if the determinant is negative, it doesn't matter what the trace is, you've got a saddle. I'll show you on the whiteboard. If the determinant is zero, you have three choices for trace, negative, zero, or positive. 
and you have these three cases. If the determinant is zero and the is if the trace if the determinant is greater than zero, then you have still three choices for trace, and they break down into more cases. I'm going to erase this mystery point reference because it clutters the drawing. But I don't want to think in terms of this family tree, although it depends on what kind of style of thinking you do. If you're thinking in a computer science -y way, then uh, trees and searching on trees, is a really efficient way to organize information. But I'm kind of visual. So I want to organize things. This is section three, seven, this is a preview. I want to organize things according to the trace determinant plane. Instead of horizontal axis is X, vertical axis is Y. Let's make horizontal axis T right here and vertical axis D. And why do I use those two dimensions? Because every matrix has a trace and determinant. And so based on the trace and determinant of a matrix, I can locate it in this chart. Think of this as a chart as if you'd have on a ship or on an airplane, a navigation chart. And then I can identify it by where it lands on this chart. Everything below the T-axis is a saddle. And that's everything that has a negative determinant. I could expand this window slightly. Yeah, saddles, negative determinant. Everything on the right-hand side, the first quadrant has a positive trace. And positive trace is going to mean I have some form of growth. Sources, spiral sources, and then crazy cases like the almost spiral source. We did one example last time or the sunburst source or the equilibrium line source. Everything on the left, the trace is negative. That means I'm gonna have a decay action. So first I've got the whole plane, bottom quadrants, saddle, upper right source, upper left sink. Then I've got all these different flavors. But before we get into this picture in section 3.7, I want you to understand that this picture is separated into large regions, like the whole bottom is a saddle land. And under this parabola is source land. Under parabola, upper right. Above parabola, upper right is spiral source land, a whole region that's filled with spiral sources. The other cases are border cases. They live on the parabola, the sunburst source, the almost spiral source, sunburst sink, the almost spiral sink, the equilibrium line source and equilibrium line sink. All of those I deliberately wrote on this border, either parabola or the upper D axis or the left and right T axis. It almost seems as if I wrote saddle on the border, which is lower D axis, but no, I kind of meant for saddles to be in this whole space. This whole third and fourth quadrant is filled with saddles, and we'll show you why. I don't mean to make a smiley face out of it, sorry. Okay, so after we have our calculation for all of the systems, then on Monday, the first thing we're gonna do is wrap it up into this picture. So I'm gonna go backwards now and go back to my paper we still have to get these transition cases. I call them transition cases or bifurcation cases because they're the cases on the borders. Call them border cases if you like. But the technical word 
from chapter one is bifurcation. It's the place where something changes. Okay, so let's concentrate our energy on examples of transition cases and complex case, if you like. If you have a preference which one we start with, you can put that in the window. But before I do that, I'm going to go over to the whiteboard for just a second. So let me lock the whiteboard in the recording. Let me turn this around so that you might have a chance of getting my attention if necessary. And then let's summarize these cases again. And orange, let me look at my monitor and see if orange works. It doesn't seem too bad. I'm just checking my monitor. And you can expand the size of the screen, but orange seems okay. Shout out if it doesn't work. So let's look at these cases, sink, source, saddle. Do you realize that all these cases are very definite instructions? See, two negative eigenvalues means two streams of decay. Let me get two colored pens. Two streams, let's say this is the point into the vector, the arrow end. This is the arrow into the vector. I've got two streams of decay. Everything is being sucked into the origin. That's the sink. If I have one going into the origin, one coming out of the origin, that means I have things flying by the origin. One stream in, one stream out, that's the saddle. And if I have two streams out, everything's being blown away from the origin, that's the source. But now you can see why saddles are so easy to identify. Because what's a saddle? One negative eigenvalue, one positive eigenvalue. What happens when you multiply negative number times positive number? You get negative number. But what happens when you multiply lambda one times lambda two? You get determinant. So if you ever see a matrix with a negative determinant, two by two, first order linear system, you just call it a saddle. It's over. You know exactly what it is. If you have a negative determinant, one of these people is negative, and you've got a saddle. You say, well, one of them could be zero. No, no, no. If one of them was zero, then the product would be zero. The determinant would be zero. Oh, both of them could be negative. Well, then in that case, their product would be positive and you either have a sink or a source. So this is very easy to classify. Now let's go and classify this. Again, spiral sink, spiraling in, spiral source, spiraling out. Center, neither in nor out. What is the key factor right here? I'm going to choose a black pen. It's the real part of the complex number. Now the beta, let's say alpha beta, let's use Greek letters. The beta is the oscillation, the cosine theta plus i sine theta. Cosine beta t plus i sine beta t in our language. But this alpha drove excuse me, drove the exponential. And if alpha is positive, it's growth. If alpha is negative, it's decay. If alpha is zero, it's neither growth nor decay. 
So now I know how to identify these three immediately. If I got a complex number and alpha is negative, I have a spiral sinking. If I have complex number and alpha is positive, I have a spiral source. If I have complex number and alpha is zero, that's the only other way it could be, then I have neither growth nor decay and I have a center. Now, by the way, this is our first bifurcation case because centers must be transitions between spiraling in and spiraling out. I can spiral out, I can spiral in, but what's the tipping point between spiraling in and spiraling out? Not spiraling. Okay, so here's a beautiful thing. These six cases are very easy to identify. And they are the major regions on that trace determinant plane, with the exception of the center. The center was that vertical positive D axis. Notice, by the way, the center, the vertical positive D axis, the determinant axis, is when trace is zero. Why is trace zero for the center? Because the alpha is zero. And what is trace? Alpha one plus alpha two. So if alpha is zero and you add plus beta i and minus beta i, what do you get? Zero. So the center is naturally the place where the trace is zero. Okay, so these are quick to identify. These are the major regions and the first border case. <coughs> now these are the cases that are not so strong. These are strongly determined, clear growth, clear decay, or clearly in the middle. Here's clear growth, clear decay, or one in, one out saddle. These are the cases where everything is determined by two dimensions. But here, in these six cases, I'm lacking something. Let's look at this case in green. What if one of the eigenvalues is zero? Well, then I have neither a growth indication or a decay indication in that space. Here's a negative eigenvalue. That's a decay indicator. Here's a positive eigenvalue. That's a growth indicator. But it's only one dimension of growth or decay. What am I lacking here? Neither one of these is zero, but they're both the same. If they're both the same, then they represent only one direction. They're literally linearly dependent. And I don't have any indication of growth or decay necessarily in the other dimension. This is what became the almost spiral source sink or the sunburst source sink, but we'll do an example. We did an example of almost spiral source at the end last time. I think it was a source or a sink. I think it was a source. So this case is when you have like one degenerate piece of information. You have one piece of information lacking. Here's a negative number, but the other number is zero. Here's a positive number, but the other number is zero. Here's two negative numbers, but they're both the same. That repeats. Here's two positive numbers, but they're both the same. I only get one piece of information. The final example is the mystery point which must be extremely rare, right? So this whole board goes from less rare, and as we cross the board, more and more rare. Why would this be rare? Well, if both of the eigenvalues are zero, then I'm lacking two 
growth or decay indicators. In fact, remember these points up here, if both the eigenvalues are zero, I'm looking at a matrix with zero trace and zero determinant. What kind of matrix is that going to be? You could say the matrix with zero, 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 zero. That's got zero trace and zero determinant. And that's not a very exciting matrix. It's pretty rare. When I use the word rare, remember I'm talking about what if we just picked four numbers at random? If you picked four numbers, real numbers out of the universe at random, what are the odds that you'd pick zero four times? Rare. But zero, 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 zero is not the only way to have this. There are other matrices that could have trace zero and determinant zero. I can make up a simple example. It's easy to make a matrix with trace zero. How about one and minus one? That matrix right there has trace zero. Currently, its determinant is negative one. I can make the determinant zero by adding one. How about four and minus one fourth? I don't usually yank out the fractions. And I could have done it another way, but I just wanted to be general. What's the determinant of this? Negative one, subtract negative one. This has trace zero and determinant zero. So this fits that very rare category. Now you might say, that's not so rare. That's four different numbers. What was rare about that? What was rare was the trace and determinant are both zero. So the flow in this system must be kind of strange and unusual. And I should be able to give you an example of that today. And you should be able to see problems like this in your home. Notice interesting in this matrix that I wrote down is the two rows are already multiples of each other. They both got the one to four ratio. Here's one to four, here's minus one fourth to minus one. Both have a one to four ratio. Okay, so I like this board as a summary. I've added lots of things to the board. It's kind of too busy now. But on the positive side, you can scrub the video. You know, you can go through the video, stopping whenever you want. And you can recover when I wrote all these things down. But if you want, and maybe I should write this down here. I don't know where to write this down that I haven't already destroyed with space. As I go from left to right on this board, I go from most common to least common. From most common, this purple pen is kind of dry, most rare, most unusual. In fact, the one case that you have over here that's rare but useful will be the almost spiral source and sink, which we gave you last time. And you'll see the reason for that in section 3.6. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, with that, let me hopefully not disconnect everybody. Turn my thing around, and we're going to pick up an example. So, by the way, I did write this down on my paper, and now I'll repin my paper. I did write these classifications down here. And in fact, for the mystery point, if you want to be really specific, 
and give names to everything we've done. The mystery point looks like one of these three icons. For a mystery point, there won't be one equilibrium at the center. There will be a whole line of equilibriums. that cuts the plane into three types. And this is worth fixing this picture and names in your mind. So I'll draw three demonstration systems. The angle at which I'm drawing this line of equilibrium points is not critical. That's determined by the actual numbers in the matrix. But the behavior is very visual and not hard to remember if you pick my three funny descriptors. In the first case that's possible, you get a whole line of equilibrium points like this. And on one side, you get a streams that are flowing parallel. And on the other side, streams that are flowing parallel in the opposite direction. And I call this the US system because it's like driving on a road in the United States. The next possibility is you get parallel solutions on one side and parallel solutions on the other side. But this time, and they're not the same because this time I'm driving on the left side of the road from either perspective. I have never, I mean, I've, I've driven in another country. I've driven in Germany. Thankfully, if you're going 110 miles an hour, you don't want to be confused about what side of the road you're on. So Germany, I could have said Germany and UK, but US, UK. In the UK, they drive on the left side of the road. And I don't know what would ever happen if I tried that. I'd someday, it would be, I'd like to visit England. I'd like to visit the UK. But I, I wonder how hard it would be to adjust to driving on the other side of the road. I, I've never heard anybody really complain about it. Just, you just do it and everybody else is doing it. Okay, third example I call La La Land for two reasons. And this would be the example of everybody is zero. That's the only way to do this because I grew up in Southern California, LA, San Diego, Anaheim, California. And this is what the freeway looked like every day. Cars weren't driving on one side, the cars weren't driving on the other side, the cars were just stopped. If you have a matrix that only is filled with zeros, then what kind of differential system do you have? You have a differential system with absolutely no growth or decay. You have absolutely no movement. I guess I could call this a field of death, but I thought, I thought back to the opening scene in La La Land. You know, I don't know what movies you like. I thought it was a fun movie. Emma Stone, Ryan Gosling. The opening scene, we're on the freeway and all the cars have stopped and they get out and dance. No one on the planet other than me calls it that. But for right now, you and I will agree to call it that. In fact, no one ever uses these descriptors either. And I don't think the reason is because they don't like me or they don't like the way I think or that I'm out in left field. It's just that these are very rare. So you don't encounter them very often. And if you do, just for a moment. Okay, that's still a 50,000 foot description of what's happening. 
you want to see the actual solutions. So let's pick up some examples here in 3.5 or 3.4. This is the most useful case and the least rare among the rare cases. This is the most rare among the rare cases. Choosing between the other two, it's very hard to say which one is more rare here. We'll say that this is the second most useful and this is more rare, third most useful. Okay, that's the organization for today. I'm gonna to pick a problem out of three, five. I'm gonna pick a problem out of three, four. You can always throw ones you want to see into the chat, but let's do something in three, five. And today I'm gonna to be very much just crank, crank, crank the mechanical calculation. So I can get in quite a few and not just talk about the philosophy. We've done our philosophy talk now. So let's pick up something like uh, 3.5 number six. So let's actually crank out the solution to this differential system. And just by way of preview, if I'm looking at this correctly, this is an almost spiral sink. By the time we're done with you on Monday, you will also look at the four numbers and name the thing exactly. But let's show you why I say that. Okay. Slider paper over, number of pages. But remember, here's the first thing we do. Whenever someone hands us a matrix, we write down the trace. We write down the determinant. Eight minus negative one is nine. And then we write down the characteristic equation, lambda squared minus six lambda plus nine equals zero. Remember the characteristic equation is always lambda squared minus trace lambda plus determinant equals zero. You may know exactly why it's like that if you've done some linear algebra, maybe later I'll tell you why, but even in larger matrices, the last number is the determinant plus or minus sign and the first number other than the leading coefficient is the trace. But don't, uh, if you haven't done that before, don't worry about it. Okay, what's going on right here? This actually factors. Lambda minus three, lambda minus three. So I'm in my degenerate case. Lambda one and lambda two are both three. Oh, okay, did I say that correctly? I did say that correctly, but now that makes this a source. I should have known it was in source land because it's got a positive trace and a positive determinant. In the trace determinant plane, it's over here. That's source fill, that's source land. Okay. What do we do when we have repeated eigenvalue? We go for the almost eigenvector, the generalized eigenvector, but let's first do the A minus lambda I. Get my eigenvector going. So we subtract lambda, there's only one lambda on the main diagonal. Subtract three on the main diagonal. Give me a minus one, one, minus one, one. Give me an eigenvector. 
safety check time, are these two rows multiples of each other? Yes. They don't have to be identical, but they have to be multiples. Pick out the eigenvector. One, one is a simple choice because this vector is killed by that matrix. What's the next step? I only have one eigen value. So I can only have one independent eigenvector, but I can go for the next best thing. The next best thing would be the almost eigenvector in linear algebra language, the generalized eigenvector. So let's put my one one here in black. This is a green pen right here. It shows up better when I copy, but how do I pick a vector that gets sent to one one? It's not hard to do by the combinations of the numbers. One of these can be zero and the other one you notice can be one. That'll make one, one. When I multiply row times column, when I dot row and column, we get one and one. Now I've got my two linearly independent solutions. The first is the traditional eigenvector, e to the eigenvalue, three t, so this is growth. And the second is based on the almost eigenvector, the generalized eigenvector. You have the t times the eigenvector right here. Like you got rid of interference when you were doing method of undetermined coefficients section 1.8. And then you have the plus almost eigenvector right here. Now remember our initial condition was supposed to be one zero. What are these two initial conditions? Y one, sorry, I'm not sliding up there nicely. There's my first solution based on the eigenvector. Second solution is a combination of the eigenvector times T plus the almost eigenvector. Get those in the right order. And initial conditions, one, one. An initial condition of the second solution, zero, one. Because when you put T equals zero in here, this wipes out. This becomes a one multiplied by zero, one. So now I want to know what combination of one, one and zero, one will get me my initial condition of one, zero. Now check this out. Remember how zero is my friend. On the top row, I just have one equals K one times one, zero times K two. So in order to get this one, I have to choose K1 equals one. Now that I have K1 is one, one times one plus K2 is zero. So K2 must be minus one. You can do this any way you like, but these are the two numbers that make one zero. Now I'm gonna write my final answer in two ways. Well, I'm gonna actually write it in three ways. So first, I could because I wrote y1 and y2 above, right here. I wrote y1 and y2 down, so no one can tell me I didn't write that down. I could just give you the general linear combination. One times y1 minus one times y2. I could also give you the vector with the formulas written in. And I'm not gonna write down one times y1 anymore. I'll just write down one, one, e3t. I don't need to write one out front. Here I'll write minus one, don't write the one. What's this? t plus zero and t 
plus one, also times e three t. And the third way I could write it is by explicitly writing the x of t and y of t. And the reason why I like this is I'm going to go take it to Desmos to make an impression on you. So what's the x of t across the top row? E3t minus TE3t. What's the y of t across the bottom row? E3t minus t plus 1 E3t. Or if I simplify by factoring out the E3t, 1 minus t times E3t. And here I have a 1 minus 1 is the negative t times E3t. <clears throat> so sometimes I like to write out the component functions so that I can graph them very easily. I'm going to graph those two so you can see what's going on. I'm going to do it in Desmos, and then I'll do it in Mathematica. First, let me share a Desmos screen with you and just type x of t. Remember how Mathematica gets angry about whether x is horizontal axis or not? So first of all, I'll type it as I wrote it, but if necessary, I'll just do this capital X, exponential 3t. Yeah, Mathematica is driving it sideways. So let's make it like that. Good. Now let's do y of t equals minus t e to the 3t. I'm going to have to zoom in considerably on this. OK. I might expand the window, too. And then let's do the parametric representation, x of t, comma, y of t. And let's do that for minus 1, well, minus 2 to 2 seconds. I'm going to expand this window. First of all, there's the solution in the plane. And as time goes forward, the solution is increasing. If you'd like to see that, I could add a parameter like capital T, add a slider, and then show you as time goes forward, I want to see that thing going. It's not going for me, is it? I thought I would. Oh, there's the point sliding forward. Ah, it slides so fast out of the way. So how am I going to fix that? I'm going to write the curve in here, x of t, lowercase, y of t, lowercase. And then I'm going to run that from minus 2 to 2. And I'm also going to run this t from minus 2 to 2. And I'm going to make that dot the black thing. And I'm going to make this curve. I prefer red to green. OK, now let's run this dot. See, as time goes forward, that dot is exiting the screen. So my solution is outward bound on this almost spiral. It's not a spiral because along the line y equals 1 or y equals x, I have a border case. Now I'm going to do this side by side. I take this over here. Let me put a Mathematica window right next to this so I can do full demo of graphics. and. I may be able to get both these windows up at once. So what I'm going to do is get two windows up at once, the Mathematica window. Nope. Excuse me. Let me try it again. I don't do this one every day. Desmos window, Mathematica window. Oh, I have to hold shift command to do both. OK, now I'm doing it. Now I have both things on the screen at the same time. 
And let's feed this matrix. This original matrix was what? Two, one, minus one, four? Two, one, minus one, four. And we feed it to Mathematica. Mathematica confirms all of our calculations. Notice it doesn't give us an almost eigenvector. I didn't ask for that. It gives us the eigenvector of one, one, and then it gives us zero, zero for another eigenvector. In other words, it failed to find a second eigenvector. Initial condition was one, zero. Then I'll input the system. I'll plot streamlines. And show you that graphic. There's the graphic, just like the Desmos window. Now this window is a little larger. If I made that Desmos window minus five to five, it would look exactly like this. I got a bad point right there at one zero. One zero is the point. One zero is the point. One zero is the point. I should not have that red dot there. Why do I have the red dot at one zero? Oh, because the initial value I didn't change. Good. Now I got it. Okay, there's my initial value at one zero, but this is a smaller image than this. So let me go to Desmos and pump this up to minus five to five. Now, these people could be twins. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito, movie twins, it was forgettable. These people could be twins, they are the same solution. But here in Mathematica, I get to see everything else spiraling out. Okay, the reason why I wanted on my paper to write these X of T, Y of T, I go back to my paper is because I wanted to show you that you could physically, with your calculator even, any ordinary device, plot this curve by typing these equations in parametrically. And that's exactly what I did in the Desmos. I just typed those equations in parametrically and told Mathematica to, I'm sorry, told Desmos to plot them get a little animation action going on. We can do animation in Mathematica too. Desmos animation is simpler, but it's also easily executed. So I kind of like Desmos for that reason. Okay, I'm gonna stop this right now. So I get seasick and I'm gonna go back to my paper. Okay, good. Let me rearrange some windows on my screen so that I stay organized. So that was another example of almost spiral sync. And it's almost spiral sync. Let me go back to the Mathematica window. Because I have one straight line solution and only one straight line solution, let me add some flow lines in here. You see them in light gray, but let me emphasize them at one, one and minus one, minus one. I'll add some flow lines by copying that red point and going bang, bang. And let's make it at one, one. And let's make it at minus one, minus one. Got it. And let's make those for emphasis blue. And then let's make one more blue thing that matched my red thing. Instead of one zero, let's make minus one zero. Copy, paste, minus one zero. Now I have a full face portrait. And do you see what I mean by almost spiral? I have one straight line solution that acts as a wall and the other solutions want to spiral, but they can't because the wall blocks them. So they kind of half spiral out of there. They never get to do full loops around the origin. 
because this wall through the eigenvector is blocking them. That's why very visually, we call this an almost spiral source. If the arrow is reversed, we call it almost spiral sink. Okay, we're going to do next another case out of three five. This was number six. I want to show you equilibrium line sink source. I'll try hard to make sink. And I'll make this an equilibrium line. I'll pick another problem out of three, five before we go and do the complex example. So I'm checking out that. Many things are possible. I'll take 18. Sorry, I gotta go back to my paper. So we just did six, let's do 18. And we're about to take a break. But after we do that, then we'll come back and do a complex number example, if you like. Move this off, move this off. This is page three. This is 3.5, number 18. And the system goes like this. Let's make it 18 alt, because I don't like their initial condition. It's boring. So I got two, four, three, six times y and y at zero is, and he said one zero, which is what we used last time. That's not very exciting. Let's make it uh, one minus three. For all I know, that's a terrible choice, but let's roll with it. Okay, we are gonna take a break in a second, but not before we write down trace, determinant, and eigenvalues. Anytime someone hands you a square matrix, those should be the first three things you do. Trace eight, two plus six. Determinant 12 minus 12, that's unusual. Determinant zero. So now I have this characteristic equation. Lambda squared minus eight lambda. I'm kind of annoyed with myself because I picked a source again. We got to make really sure next one's a sink. But anyway, what are the eigenvalues? This factors into lambda and lambda minus eight. So the eigenvalues are zero and eight. Degenerate case, degenerate case. Eight is going to be a growth input, but zero is neither growth nor decay. Okay, so we're going to come back and construct the general solution. The good news is it'll be fully realized with two independent eigenvectors, but the graph is going to look odd in some way. Okay, let's take five here. Let's call it uh, 103 to be generous. And then we'll come back and do this case of an equilibrium line source. I wanted a sink, but I got a source. Okay, I'm going to just Need the microphone for a second, stretch my legs. You can do the same.
Okay, and we're back. Now this is a very unusual looking system. But the calculations, because I have two separate eigenvalues, are very comfortable. I get into trouble when I have repeated eigenvalues. Then I'm lacking something. Here I describe this as lacking something, lacking a growth or decay indicator, but that's not gonna stop us. So let's do an eigenvector for both of our eigenvalues. I'm gonna write down the matrix by subtracting the eigenvalue on the main diagonal. When the eigenvalue is zero, that's an easy subtraction. I will do the same for eight. Subtract eight. Subtract eight. Good. Now, after you get used to doing this, really writing the zero, zero thing, stuff equals zero, zero is really not relevant. I just can pick the right ratio. But just to remind you what an eigenvector is, it's the vector that gets killed by this matrix. So picking the vector that gets killed by this matrix, I reverse these two numbers, four, two, make one negative, four minus two, reduce the common factor, let's call it two minus one. Here, I'll call it four, six, or two, three. I will switch the two, three, and take off the minus n. So I have two legitimate eigenvectors. That means I have two legitimate straight line solutions. Uh, maybe, what's lacking? Well, let's look at y1. y1 is eigenvector e to the eigenvalue t. And now I see my issue. e to the zero t is just one. The y1 is just a single dot. It's not going in, it's not going out. It's just a single point. y2 looks more normal to me. Eigenvector, e to the 8t. Now, by the way, that's a horrific growth rate. I mean, that's serious growth rate, but this problem was out of the book. I didn't make this one up. So this is already straight line solution. Growth, very fast growth. Let's draw this and then we'll look to Mathematica for confirmation. But that growth rate is so extreme, I don't think my graphic is gonna look that nice. Maybe it's not too bad, maybe it's gonna come out. Okay, so I draw my phase plane and I'm gonna make a phase portrait. First, I draw a dot at two and minus one. And that doesn't look very useful. But let's think about this eigenvector, two and minus one. Could I have chosen minus two, one? Yes, I could. Could I have chosen four and minus two? Yes, I could. Could I have chosen minus four and two? Yes, I could. In fact, any multiple of that two minus one combination would be a single point solution. So now you see the meaning of the name. I'm gonna get a whole line of equilibrium solutions, not a line of motion, but a line composed entirely of equilibrium solutions. Now this looks like the dividers that I created in my funny explanation at the beginning of class. And by the way, the dots are everywhere. 
that's a whole line of dots, infinitely many, way too many to count or draw. That's why it's called an equilibrium line. Or that's why I call it the equilibrium line. Now let's look at two, three. And where was our initial condition? One and minus three. One and minus three, let's make initial condition. Let's pick out a more meaningful color. One and minus three is right here. And what is this direction called two and three? This direction is a growth direction, right? It's the direction of two over three up. So I'm not very comfortable with that yet. Where am I going? Two over three up does not look like the way I want things to flow. Two over three up would take me into the rocks, would wreck my boat on these rocks. And I'm trying to think about just for a second carefully, did I lose a minus sign? Did I put the one minus three in a bad place? No, this is a two minus one ratio. This is the one minus three. So I think I better find my solution through one and minus three before I talk myself into making a mistake. Let's look at my initial condition vectors, which were the eigenvectors two minus one and two, three. Let's find the K one and K2 that do that job. Now that's actually gonna be some work. And again, you're solving two equations, two unknowns. Two K1 plus two K2 is minus one and negative K1 plus three K2 is minus three. I'm not gonna tell you how to solve that because you've solved lots of things like that in the past. I'm just gonna do it the way I would do it. Give me a zero there, give me an eight there, give me a minus seven. I hope this is minus seven eighths. What I'm doing is taking the second equation, multiplying by two and adding to the first. So no K1s, eight K2s, and minus seven on the constant on the other side. That should give me the minus seven eighths. Let's try K1, see how things go. Three, two, let's take the K2 minus seven eighths stick in here, minus 21 eighths. This is minus 24 eighths. If I add 21, I get minus three eighths. There's a minus sign there. That should be three eighths. Now we test in both to make sure. Six eighths minus 14 eighths is minus eight eighths, yes. Negative three eighths minus 21 eighths is minus 24 eighths, yes. So these are correct. So that means my solution to this problem, let me make sure everything is still on screen, good, is 3 eighths of 2 minus 1 stop, 2 minus 1 e to the 0 t, but that's just 2 minus 1, minus 7 eighths of Two thirds or two two three not two thirds e to the eight t. Let's write these individual x of t and y of t functions across the top. Be three eighths times two is three fourths minus seven eighths times two minus seven fourths e to the eight t. And on the bottom, three eighths times minus one is minus three eighths. Minus seven eighths of three is minus 21 eighths. e to the eight t. And now I see where this dot is going. The minus three fourths minus three eighths is somewhere in here. And that's where this is starting. And then 
at a one to three ratio, this is going down in the x-axis, down in the y-axis. So it's actually coming out, oh, am I meeting my initial condition? Minus four fourths is minus one. Well, something is not feeling right because I'm not meeting my initial condition, right? Because if I put t equals zero in here, I got three fourths minus seven fourths. So that's where I'm getting screwed up. If I put zero in here, I get minus three eighths, minus 21 eighths. There's sixes somewhere, I'm missing something. Minus three eighths, minus 21 eighths is minus 24 eighths. That's good, that's a minus three. But why is this minus seven quarters? That's three quarters minus seven quarters is minus one quarter. I put a minus one here. I should have put a plus one. Okay, screwed up. So let's fix it. I do two of these, two of these is eight, two of these is minus five. And then if K2 is minus five, it's minus 15 eighths, minus 24 eighths. Add to the other side, 15 eighths is nine eighths. Negative, so this is nine eighths positive. So let's change this to nine eighths positive and minus five eighths negative. Let's try again. 9 fourths minus 5 fourths, it's not terribly butchered, minus 9 eighths minus 15 eighths. Okay, so the 9 fourths and minus 9 eighths is about here. And then I'm shooting out at a two to three ratio, except the two to three ratio is two over three down. So I'm actually shooting out like that. Here are the solutions to the system. The equilibrium line spits out solutions on the two to three ratio. but only one of them is going to go through my desired starting point at one and minus three. So here's the phase portrait for this system. Equilibrium line source. And now let's see this confirmed in Mathematica. So this will be visually actually very nice. So I will give back to the Mathematica screen and feed this matrix. So this matrix was two, four, three, six, two, four, three, six, and there's all the confirmations, the eight zero and the two three and the two minus one. Well, Mathematica chose minus two one. It's okay, just a different starting point. Our initial condition was one and minus three. There's the system. And let's get some streamlines. Let's ignore this stuff for a moment. And I got my initial condition in there and I'm gonna make everything light gray. Let's see what this looks like and then we'll decorate it. <coughs> it's a little bit hard to follow. Instead of light gray, let me make that gray. Let me do my initial condition at one and minus three and make this just a little darker by saying gray. It's an equilibrium line source. 
this line, and remember, Mathematica does not draw the equilibrium points for me. I had to add that one at zero, zero. But there's a whole wall of equilibrium points along here. And everything else is a straight line solution shooting out at a two horizontal to three vertical ratio. Even down here, minus two, minus three ratio. So this is a funny looking system. It's not a spiral. It's not a saddle. It's not a sink from two directions. It's not a source from two directions. It's only a source in one dimension. It's a one dimensional source shooting out upper right or lower left. And there's my special solution. If you'd like to see Mathematica confirm that solution, just have it compute and you can match this against the numbers that we wrote, that we eventually wrote correctly. Not very exciting to make those errors. How about solutions in the plane? There's a straight line solution shooting out and here's just two exponential growth curves upside down. Very extreme ones, remember, because I was dealing with e to the 8t. Okay, that is called an equilibrium line source. Okay, now we're gonna do the complex calculation for practice. And since your homework has a complex number problem, which is kind of nasty, nasty looking numbers, I'll pick something here that'll prepare you for it. But first I wanna say this. So we've done almost spiral sink source example. We've done equilibrium sink source example. If I just reverse the direction of the arrows, it would be a sink. I have not done the sunburst source and I have not done the US, the UK and the La La Land, the mystery point. And that's because I marked those as most rare. When we put everything together in our beautiful trace determinant picture on Monday, we'll be able to bring these to you with minimal effort. These two, the sunburst sink source and the mystery point, US, UK or La La Land, are the most rare cases. And I don't wanna spend time calculating those right now. Let's do a hard complex number calculation. So I'm going to go to section three, four and pick one out. Uh, and we're going to have to do it efficiently because it takes time to do these. I'm going to look at my numbers here. minus trace of minus two. I'd like to do a sink someday. So I'm looking at number five and three, four. What's the determinant? Negative three plus 15, 12. Number five is not the worst case scenario. And to help you prepare, Let's do a worst case scenario. I'm going to do a five alt. The worst case. Calculationally. Calculationally scenario. This is 3.4, number five, but I'm going to alter it to make it harder than his. If you can do this one, you can do anything. It's not conceptually the most odd case, it's calculationally the most odd case. So let's say I got y prime is equal to, and I hope this is gonna work out. Let's try it. Um, this is gonna be nasty. Minus two, one, three, minus five. 
and y of zero is four one. Now, I made this worse than the book in two ways. You can look at the original three, four, five. It turns out I made this messier in the original problem. He has the number in the upper left, a minus three. I kept all the other numbers. Put a minus two here, it's gonna be a little more work. His initial condition was four zero, which was no gift, by the way. The four one will be a little more work. But we are not afraid. So remember what your mission is. Anytime someone hands you a square matrix, you write down trace determinant eigenvalues. That's not a big deal because it's two by two. If it was a three by three, it'd be more work. There'd be three eigenvalues. Four by four, four eigenvalues. So the bigger the matrix, the more work this is for trace determinant eigenvalues. But we're only doing two by twos. Okay, trace minus one. Determinant negative two subtract negative 15. Negative two subtract negative 15, negative two plus 15, which is 13. So make sure you get those right, because if you don't get those right, you're just driving off a cliff and you won't know until you hit the bottom. Thelma and Louise, Susan Sarandon, and Gina Davis, right? So trace minus one, minus two plus 15 is 13 positive. Let's do it. Lambda squared plus one lambda plus 13. This one is not gonna factor. And so we can use the quadratic formula if you like. If you've watched the video, you can do the super fast quadratic formula in your head. Video on my website, but even that takes practice. So I don't mind if you use a quadratic formula. But if you want me to run through this method here, you got a one here. So you do the opposite of half of that, minus one half. That's the real part. Then you do plus minus. I'll write them as separate ones here. One half squared, negative one half squared is one quarter. This is 52 quarters. 13 is an easy number, but if you put it in quarters, 52 quarters. You're at one quarter now. You are shy of 52 quarters. Shy of 52 quarters means you're gonna need an imaginary number. And the square root of 52 quarters, I'm sorry, how far shy are you of 52 quarters? One quarter to 52 quarters, 51 quarters, and the square root of 51 quarters is 51 over two. Root 51 over two. We did it. We found a nasty, nasty problem, eigenvalue wise. Your homework is a little bit like this. Okay, let's move quickly. We need to construct a complex solution and then extract two real solutions. Our advice is always work with the eigenvalue with a positive imaginary part. If you use the negative imaginary part, because you look ahead and see subtraction of this and want to make it positive, okay, fine. But you're going to have to, then you're going to have to use some trig identities. You say, what happens to me if I pick the other one? 
because I like to be contrary. If you pick the other one, you'll get to the same answer if you do all the work correctly. And on my website, I gave you an example side by side of picking the other one next to picking the nice one. And I showed you all the work to show you that in the end, you get the same answer. But why do extra work? So let's do our A minus lambda I. Hang on a second. Fix one of my windows. Got it, got it. A minus lambda I, and I'm gonna use lambda one. Let's be very careful with our work here and I'll try to write big because I've got fractions. So I'm gonna subtract this lambda from the main diagonal. But notice when I subtract, I'll be subtracting minus one half and subtracting positive root 51 over two. So make sure you do your subtraction correctly. Subtract minus one half, give me a minus three halves, minus root 51 over two I. Negative five does not change. Three does not change. Now let's do it again. Subtract negative one half from one. Give me a three halves. And subtract root 51 over two I. So I'm trying to write big, but even those fractions get relatively small. Okay. I. On your side, you can make your window larger, but I don't know what kind of screen real estate you have. Now, let's run through our safety checks since this is the most stressful calculation. One safety check is lambda one plus lambda two had better equal the trace. Is that true? What happens if you add these two lambdas? The imaginary parts cancel out and you get minus one. So that's good. What happens if you multiply these two lambdas? Notice that they're complex conjugates. Remember last time I showed you how to multiply complex conjugates quickly. You just have one quarter plus 51 quarters. You just square the real part, square the imaginary part and add. And what's one quarter plus 51 quarters, that's 52 quarters, which is 13. So this is lambda one plus lambda two, and this is lambda one times lambda two. That safety check is performed. Next safety check. Let's see that these two rows are multiples of each other. Again, I would pick the conjugate of this to make an easy multiplication. So three halves plus root 51 over two I, sorry, I forgot the I, multiply by the conjugate, I'll get nine quarters and 51 quarters. That's 60 quarters, which is 15. So if I multiply by three halves plus root 51 over I, uh, root 51 I over two, I'll get 15 in that second slot. And here I'll get three times three halves plus root 51 over two I. And that is exactly the opposite of this row times three. Multiply this row times three and you get this opposite. So these two rows are multiples of each other. You check it out with your multiplication, your complex multiplication. Now I select eigenvector and I'm gonna put the real number here and the imaginary number down here. I'm gonna say minus five because I hate minus signs more, I'm gonna take the opposite of this number so that I don't have as many minus signs. This is legitimate eigenvector, but I want to make my life easier. Remember any multiple of an eigenvector is an eigenvector. So easier would be if I took twice this.
didn't get rid of the radical, but it got rid of the fractions. So here, this is an easier eigenvector. You can always scale an eigenvector. Now be careful. You go back up here to your eigenvalue, say, oh, let's scale the eigenvalues. I don't want to deal with fractions there either. No, you can't do that. Eigenvalues are unique values. But the eigenvectors, there are many eigenvectors that fit with an eigenvalue. And so this eigenvector is acceptable and easier to work with. I'll bring my papers. So now I have my complex solution. Remember, I'm trying to write big because I'm stuck with fractions. You say, you got rid of the fractions. You say, no, I'm still stuck with fractions right here. E to the eigenvalue T. The eigenvalue is minus one half plus root 51 over 2i t. Some of you are asking in the audience, what's the big deal if that was have been the minus one? It would have changed this calculation, that's fine. But what's the big deal if that would have been minus? Remember, this is the frequency of the sine cosine. So instead of saying cosine root 51 over 2t, you'll be saying cosine minus root 51 over 2t and sine of minus root 51 over 2t then you're going to have to invoke the cosine of minus theta is cos theta and the sine of minus theta is sine theta. In other words, you have to pull up some trig identities to simplify. That's why I want to use the positive imaginary part on the eigenvalue. Okay, now let's go to the next step. Since I write big, it's going to be more space I need to use. So this might get a little more cramped. What do I got here? I got a minus 10, 3 plus root 51i. And then I'm going to expand this into an imaginary part and a real part. i times root 51 over 2t. That's my frequency, my angular frequency, sine and cosine. And this is gonna be minus one half T. This splits into the cosine theta plus I sine theta. This is why I need space. But don't forget this exponential decay that's attached here on the outside. I did succeed in writing big and fitting it all in. On the next line though, we will not. So I'm gonna have to do a little smaller. Now let's remember the logic here. These are all complex numbers except for the red thing. The red thing is real number function, classical exponential decay. But here I have complex number, cosine plus I sine, goofy inside. So I'm not gonna speak the inside. I'll just say cosine plus I sine, or cosine stuff plus I sine stuff. Here's a complex number, three plus root 51 I. That's ugly in its own way. And the minus 10, remember we said this last time, is a complex number, minus 10 plus zero i. So here I'm taking two complex numbers times a third complex number. And the idea is that just creates another batch of complex numbers. This is as big as I'm ever gonna be able to write. But 
that means that I'll have parts without an I and parts with an I. So what I've got to do is multiply this out and collect all the pieces that don't have an I. For example, minus 10 times cosine of stuff is minus 10 cosine stuff. And now you see how this is going to get nasty for space. Tear off the paper. It's going to get too crowded. So write your own version, if you like, later. What's minus 10 times the imaginary part? That's minus 10 sine root 51 over 2. I gave myself a little more space over here. You say, it's minus 10i. I got the i out here. I don't want to write the i. I keep the i out here. Part without an i, part with an i. Across the top, there's not a bad deal. But now across the bottom, I've got a full foiling. I've got two complex numbers, and I'm going to have to foil them out. First, the part without the i is when the 3 hits the cosine. I'm going to try to squeeze it in. But I also give no i if the root 51 i strikes the i sign, because i i is minus 1. I just am going to barely squeeze this in. So minus 10 times this complex number is easy to break down. But 3 plus root 51 i times this complex number is going to have four pieces. 3 times cos, root 51 i times i sine. And then with the i will be 3 times sine positive 3 times positive i sine. But here's the i. 3 times sine root 51 over 2 t. And root 51 i strike the cosine gives me a root 51 i cos. Here's the i. Root 51 cosine root 51 over 2t. Wow, what a mess. It's a mess, but I now have two independent real solutions. I'll try to write them larger. 3 cosine root 51 over 2 t minus root 51 sine root 51 over 2 t. Don't forget that each one of these gets an e to the minus 1 half t. I'll keep that in red. So you can focus on it. And the top here is minus 10 cosine root 51 over 2t. Notice this is still two-dimensional vector, two rows, one column. But I like to write the sines and cosines staggered in their own spaces. Here's my y2. Forget the I, just the green part. Also multiply by e to the minus 1 half t. And that is root 51 cosine root 51 over 2t plus 3 sine. 51 over 2 t and sine. And I also had a minus 10 in the top slot. Sine, sorry. Move the paper up. 
my fault. It's not moving too far up. So you can see the one above it too. So this is why complex solution is the worst case. You know, you got to multiply these complex numbers carefully and keep track carefully of who has an eye and who doesn't have an eye. And if you screw it up, you'll not know until you get to perform a safety check. Remember what your mother told you. It's funny until someone loses an eye. Is that what your mother told you when you and your brother, or you and your sister were throwing rocks at each other and stuff? Okay, here are my two real solutions. Are they linearly independent? Put in a zero for all the t's. And here you get minus 10 and three. And in y2, you get zero and root 51. How did we do that so quickly? Well, that's because putting zeros into sines and cosines only produces zeros and ones. Putting a zero into exponential only produces a one, e to the zero. So what I have here is minus 10 times one, three times one, zero and one. It's minus 10 or three. And what I have here is root 51 times one, minus 10 times zero, three times zero, and a one. That's zero and 51 root. Safety check time. Where did those numbers come from? Our complex eigenvector. If you don't see these two sets of numbers coming from your complex eigenvector, minus 10, three real part, zero, root 51 imaginary part. If you don't see that, you did something wrong. But now I feel good. Okay, one more serious hurdle, and then we can do the graphic. What was our initial condition? Four and one. But what is the problem? We need to figure out the ratio of these two initial conditions. We need to find the K1 and K2 that make this true equals 4, 1. First, that looks really, really bad because of this root 51. But actually, I don't see the root 51. I see the zero. Remember what we said, zero is my friend. Since zero is my friend, this top line says four is equal to minus 10 K1. That means K1 is four over minus 10, minus two fifths. So I get the K1 instantly because there's no contribution from K2 here. Now I gotta use my imagination on the next one. This is minus six fifths. And this is one. One equals minus six fifths, and now plus root 51 K2. That's what I got to do to finish. It's not a big, big deal, right? One is five fifths. Add six fifths, got 11 fifths. 11 fifths divided by root 51 is 11 over five root 51. It's not pretty, but it is correct. Now, here's going to be the last annoying part before we go to the nice graphics. And we're not doing terribly on time. If it was just up to me, if all I had to do was please myself, I'm trying to get all these papers on screen at the same time. There's my Y1, Y2, here's my K1, K2. Frankly, it's fine to just write 
minus two fifths y1 plus 11 over five root 51 y2. Because I have legitimately written down y1 and y2, right? The problem with that is what if someone asks you to physically demonstrate your graph? What if someone says, give me the top line and the bottom line, give me the X and Y. And the problem is now I've got to multiply this all out. Now the top row is not going to be too bad. Minus two fifths times minus 10 is a positive four, right? Four cosine root 51 over two T and minus two fifths, um, sorry, 11 over five root 51 times minus 10, they get to cancel, get minus 22 over root 51. Sign. You, you say, first of all, you're crazy for writing this all out. No, I could show you one reason why we might want to. Bottom's gonna be harder because I'm gonna take minus two fifths times three coses. That's minus six fifths coses. But then 11 over five times divided by root 51 kills this root 51. So I got minus six fifth cos plus 11 fifth cos. What is minus six fifths plus 11 fifths? It's five fifths. So it's one cos. That's beautiful. Because that's my initial condition, four and one. But I'm not going to get off so lucky here. Minus two fifths times minus root 51 is plus two root 51 over five. But 11 over 5 root 51 times 3 is 33. Sorry, I got to slide my paper up. I will in a second. Over 5 root 51. So I'm trying to figure out the next coefficient here. Ugly, ugly, ugly. But I rationalized denominator. I guess there was a reason why you learned to rationalize denominators, okay? And I get. 33 plus 2 is 35 divided by 5, root 51. 35 root 51 divided by 5, that's going to be pretty. And then root 51 times root 51 is 51. So this is 7 root 51 over 51. And it is positive or negative? It is positive. 7 root 51 over 51 sine root 51 over 2t minus 1t. That is among the hardest things you would ever do in this class, that really obnoxious complex arithmetic. And we're just about at the end of the time. We really are at the end of the time. But I'm going to put this image in. And remember how Mathematica gives us an exact answer? Now's the moment of truth. That's why I wrote these. You could also write them because you want to pump them into your calculator, right? Pump them into Desmos. Go ahead. It's going to take a lot of typing. But I want to take this problem. Where did it go? Where did it go? Way up here. And I want to put it into Mathematica and see if I don't get that answer. By the way, this is decay, right? And 4, 1 is over here. What's the initial thing, clockwise or counterclockwise? I'll take my matrix, minus 2, minus 5, 3, 1, times 4, 3, and I get minus 8, minus 5 is minus 13, and 12, 1 is 13. Oh, that means back and up. So my initial tendency is going to be like that. So this is going to be counterclockwise rotation. What's the frequency? 
Uh, route 51 is about five, root two is about seven-ish. Route 49 is seven. Seven over two, three and a half cycles every two pi seconds. This is gonna be something with a little bit busy rotation. Now right there, I'm just eyeballing it, but I think I'm gonna see some noticeable cycling. Let's pump it into Mathematica. Share screen, Mathematica, back it up. I'm gonna open this up. I'm gonna fix the size of type. And end today by doing this calculation. So it's minus two minus five. <coughs> if we get it right, then what? Super satisfying. Get it wrong, we have to fix it. There's my data, minus one trace 13 determinant characteristic equation, eigenvalues. Now notice Mathematica chose different eigenvectors than we did, right? Why did we choose our eigenvectors? for ease of calculation by hand. Mathematica just has an algorithm for choosing them. I guess for the machine, it's ease of calculation by machine. Input system, hit enter. You gotta hit enter on each line. And let's do our curve. Oh, by the way, we should do initial value right here of four and one. I haven't done that right once today yet. And then let's give it a swirl. There was my equilibrium line source a second ago. Look at that, it's beautiful. I don't like the gray, I'm gonna to go to light gray. But it is exactly what we felt. Counterclockwise rotation and noticeable cycling. Noticeable cycling. That looks very much like we eyeballed it. With a little bit of practice, you will get the same feeling too. Now, here's the moment of truth. And check this out. This is the exact solution according to Mathematica. Do you notice that two times 102, two over four over 51 is four. This looks very good. Mathematica does not organize it or clean it up the way we do. But if you went and multiplied this all out, Minus 22 or root 51. Nine over 17, I'm a little bit worried about that. This one right here doesn't look like mine. I'll go back and check mine. I got a 33 over five root 51. I have a minus two times minus root 51 over five. That's good. That's good. I'm adding 33, two, 35, canceling. 7 over root 51, or 7 over 51, excuse me. And if you see it, you can shout it out or tell me, but, oh, geez, well, let's see, somewhere, your root 51's got a 3 in it. Okay, somewhere in here, I've goofed up in my constant. Well, that's where we check it. I don't have time to identify it with you right now, but you can go and see where I screwed up. Gosh, I don't like to leave things like that. So let me scan it one more time. 33 plus two, 35 over five is seven. Root 51 over 51. Notice I'm not even considering the mathematical in there. Well, that's, that's dangerous because did I, I, but I, because I believe I input it into the system correctly. So I have seven root 51 over 51. 
and I should have 27 root 51 over 51. Where did I lose my number? I'm not gonna find it right now. Before I scan this piece of paper, I'll look at it carefully and see if I can find it. But I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna go to these solutions here. I'm gonna pick a positive time in both cases. And this presents a nice picture of oscillation and decay. Very slow decay or relatively slow decay. Okay. I like it. I can pick better windows here so that everything doesn't get clipped off, but I like it. What did we do? Super intense calculation. And I've got exactly one number out of place. I feel good. I don't feel great. Uh, before I scan this, I'll go recheck my numbers. And on the paper before I scan it, I'll see if I can write the correct number. But it's time to go and you've been very patient. So thank you very much. If you see it, hang out for a second and tell me. But I'm gonna stop the recording now.